Hello everyone, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. Now, it's been over 50 years since the last Apollo moon mission, and yet there are many people who still insist that the moon landings never really happened, and that everything we see that's claimed to have been on the moon was actually faked here on Earth. Now, as a photographer, I've looked over thousands of the Apollo images over the years, and I've come to the conclusion that the lighting and the shadows in these images is physically impossible to reproduce on Earth, which would leave only one conclusion. Now, I have asked countless conspiracy theorists to show us a studio lighting setup that can exactly replicate the look of the Apollo images, and so far I'm still waiting. So in this video, I'm going to break down the mechanics of how lighting and shadows work to show how these photographs can't have been faked on Earth. I mean, I've no doubt that this is going to lead people to accuse me of being a paid shill and say that I'm enlisted by NASA to help spread their lies, so I would just like to make it crystal clear I have no affiliation with any space agency, and I'm certainly not enlisted. This is enlisted, and it's sponsoring this video. Enlisted is the World War II shooter that brings a unique blend of PvP and PvE in an immersive combat experience with great looking graphics. Each player controls their own squads of AI soldiers fighting against other AI and players. You can customise your squad's style, configuration and equipment to suit your gameplay style, whether it's a rifle squad, engineers, tank crew or even a pilot. There are several different campaigns you can choose from, such as Moscow 1941, Berlin 1945, or I'm currently on the invasion of Normandy. And I love the scale of the battles, with the squads of soldiers and the armoured vehicles and even aircraft. Best of all is it's available on PC, PS5 and Xbox Series X and S, as well as previous console generations and is fully cross-platform compatible. Play for free using my link below and you'll receive an exclusive sign-on bonus pack to help you get started, including a 3-day premium account as well as several orders for troops and weapons. Many people have claimed that all of the images are just so perfect that they were clearly taken by professional photographers. Well, as a professional photographer, I can say I highly doubt it. If you visit the website March to the Moon, you can view all of the images that were taken throughout every Apollo, Gemini, and even Mercury missions. They took thousands of photographs just whilst on the Moon, and very few of them would be considered professional looking. It's merely that the best ones were the ones which were pushed out to the public. Most of them look more like holiday snaps, because in reality they were taking photographs for documentation purposes. Many photos of rocks and terrain for geologists to examine, photographs of the equipment setups and the lunar module for engineers to check over. There were even photographs I found taken during Apollo 16 of science experiments being done on the flight. They didn't go there for a photo shoot. I've even had people claiming images like this prove that the landings were faked because this is clearly taken on Earth. Except images like this were never claimed to have been on the moon. They were clearly stated as being taken while the astronauts were doing training before the mission, and it's even well documented in videos as well. So let's start with looking at a few images which were actually said to have been taken on the moon. Now, the only criteria I had for selecting these were they had to be taken outside of the lunar module rather than shooting through a window, so there could be no question about the, the windows becoming a factor. The images had to be looking out across the moon rather than up close on an object so that we could see the whole landscape. There had to be recognisable things within the images to give us a sense of scale, and that they weren't taken while standing near the lunar module, because as I've covered in a previous video, the lunar module was covered in highly reflective material that is essentially going to act like a second light source. So, first and foremost, we can see we're looking at a large landscape. If that is a studio, that would have to be a very large studio. Which isn't impossible, but we can also see that the terrain has quite even lighting to it. The foreground is similarly lit to the background, like if we view any random photographs of open landscapes here on Earth that are being lit by daylight. Now, to create even lighting with a single light source, all parts of the scene need to be a similar relative distance away from the light source. For example, if I take a piece of paper and I mark a point A and a point B, and I now take a torch and hold it close to point A, 
you can see that point A is very brightly lit, but point B isn't. This is due to what is called light fall off, because point A is so much closer to the light source than point B. If I were to place the torch in the middle of the two points, then both would now be lit equally to each other, but both would still be dimmer than the point where the torch is being aimed at, and that we're still seeing a hotspot there. So if this piece of paper were the moon's surface in the images, the lighting wouldn't match using a single spotlight close up. There are a few ways that you can get even lighting. We can use what is called a diffuser, which is essentially any sort of semi-translucent material that spreads the light out, such as another piece of paper placed in front of the torch. This will create a hotspot on the diffuser paper itself, but the light that's shining through the piece of paper will now be coming in from many different directions, and so creates a more even spread of light. This is like, just like big softboxes that you see in studios, which are used to create a smoother light on subjects. We could also introduce more lights. So where there are dimmer patches, we shine another light there. This works in a similar concept to the diffuser because it's now introducing more light coming in from many directions, but just having two lights would still produce their own obvious hotspots. I.e., if you've ever driven down a road at night, you'll see that under each street light is very brightly lit, but the light falls off significantly in between each one. But if you were to put enough lights together going down the road, then it would create a more even light. Like you see in sports stadiums. Or lastly, we could just move the torch further away. This will make the paper as a whole dimmer, because there's only a finite amount of light that's leaving the torch, and the further away we move the torch, then the more of that light will wind up missing the paper altogether. But what it does mean, though, is that even if the torch is placed above point A, because the torch is very far away, the distance between point A and the torch now isn't that different to the distance between point B and the torch, so both points will receive a similar amount of light as each other, but both will receive a lot less light than they would if the torch was much closer, so that would have to be offset by having a much brighter torch to begin with. Creating even lighting alone isn't really a problem. Where it becomes a problem for conspiracy theorists, though, is when we factor in the shadows, because changing the lighting also changes how the shadows will look. If we light an object with the torch, and the torch is very, very close, then we get a strong shadow right in front of the object, but it will converge into a point, and we have very faint shadows casting outside of them. This is because to create a completely black shadow requires no light getting there at all. As the light begins to get into the shadow, then the shadow becomes brighter, and once the shadow area is getting the same amount of light as the area next to it, then obviously the shadow disappears. So because the torch is so close to the object, the object is blocking the light from the center of the torch, but the outer edges of the torch are still able to shine past the object to create this converging shadow, and it also feathers the edge of it as well. As we move the light further back, its apparent size compared to the object will shrink, and so it can't shine light around it quite as much, so the shadow becomes more defined. However, in a room like this, there is then some light reflecting off the walls and such, which will bounce back towards the object and into the shadow. If we were in a completely blacked out area where light couldn't reflect back in towards the shadows, then the shadows wouldn't be getting lightened up by anything. So us moving the light source further away would still dim the object, but if we then brighten the exposure settings in the camera, the shadows wouldn't get any brighter because there's no light there to brighten up. But that's with a single spotlight. If we were to bring in multiple lights, then each one would have to throw light towards the object. Each would have areas of light that are hitting the object and casting shadows, and each would have light that misses the object and lands on the ground behind it. So each light would create its own shadow, and the light from each source that missed the object would wind up partially landing in the shadows of other lights. If all of the lights were equal power and distance from the object, then we would see an equal shadow created by each light source, and none of the lights would produce completely black shadows, because they would all be partially filled in from the other lights. 
We see examples of this at sports events with floodlights, where everything is casting multiple shadows and in different directions, but we can also see that the shadows often aren't equal unless the thing that's casting the shadows is equal distance from all the light sources. If it's closer to one of the lights, then more light from that source is going to get to the subject and create a more pronounced shadow, while the shadows from the other light sources will be fainter because the closer light source is filling them in more. And we can also see that as objects move around under the floodlights, the shadow intensities change as their distance relative to the light sources also changes. Yet if we look at video footage from the moon landings, the astronauts are moving around, even moving large distances with the rover, and yet the shadows don't move. And we only ever see one shadow cast from objects. We also see on the floodlights that shadows always point back towards the light source. So where you have two objects apart from each other, the shadows created by one of the floodlights will be pointing outwards away from each other. And having a diffused light source, whilst it would eliminate the multiple shadows, because the light would be coming in from many different angles, it would also remove any clear definition of shadows for exactly the same reason. You'd get some shading where the object is still reducing how much light gets to some parts of the ground versus an unobstructed area, but the light is coming in from so many different directions that the feathering on the shadow edges would make them look incredibly soft. Which is why many photography studios use diffusers unless they specifically want very hard lighting. So bearing all of that in mind, when we look at the moon photographs, we have even lighting across the landscapes, and we also have objects producing single shadows with hard defining edges, which we are only able to get at the same time with a single spot light source that is relatively very far away compared to all the different parts of the image. If the light was close, like in a studio, then the shadows would be softer, they'd be diverging away from each other, and they'd be changing as the objects move around because if you move 10 feet further away from a light source that is 50 feet away to begin with, it's considerably more noticeable than moving 10 feet away from a light that is 50 miles away. Now, while I mentioned diverging shadows, I would also like to quickly address the many claims that shadows are pointing in different directions in the images. These are often converging shadows, which we would expect to see due to perspective. If you stand next to metal railings with the sun directly behind you, from your perspective, the shadows will be pointing inwards towards each other. It's also possible with the regular shaped objects like rocks and uneven terrain that shadows can appear from certain perspectives to be pointing in weird directions. Now those aren't really some big gotcha moments that the conspiracy theorists think they are, because if they were evidence of it being faked, then we would also see other aspects at the same time, such as uneven lighting or multiple shadows, and they should appear in every single photograph. I've had people even try and argue that if they really went to the moon, why didn't they do a 360 degree view? Except they did. If you look through all of the images, you can see in most of the missions, there were multiple occasions where an astronaut would stand in one spot and take a sequence of images whilst turning slightly. And you can download them all and stitch them all together and make a complete 360 panorama. If this was in a studio, that wouldn't be possible because either the camera would end up looking straight at a studio crew at some point, or they would have to stop partway through and completely redesign the set and move the lighting around, which would then throw all of the lighting out of whack and mean that it wouldn't stitch together properly. So like I said to begin with, the lighting in the photographs doesn't match how lighting would behave in a studio because the light source in a studio would be too close to reproduce these images. Some people have claimed maybe they did it outside in the desert at night, but even that doesn't quite add up because there have been occasions where people have tried to replicate these images in such conditions. Even Hollywood tried it and none of them were able to accurately replicate them all wound up with noticeable light fall off in the distance because even the light there isn't far enough away from the subject. Some have suggested maybe it was done at night using moonlight or even potentially during the day with the sunlight in the desert and then they just edited out the sky. Unfortunately, the sky creates other problems for that concept in that the atmosphere acts like a diffuser. 
Even on a completely clear blue sky day on Earth, you don't get solid black shadows casting from objects because there is always light refracting in the atmosphere that's then coming in from different directions and filling in the shadows slightly. There is nowhere on Earth I can think of that would allow for a single spotlight source that is far enough away to create these defined shadows that don't move when people move around and that then doesn't have atmosphere getting in the way and refracting and filling in the shadows. Not on Earth. There is somewhere I can think of that's about 200,000 miles away, however. I mean, who knows? Let's see if a conspiracy theorist can show us a lighting setup that does perfectly replicate these images whilst on Earth. Well, that is going to wrap it up for this video. Thanks once again to Enlisted for sponsoring this. Don't forget to check out the link in the description to play the game today and to receive a nice welcome bonus. As always, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and then hopefully we'll see you in the next video.